So you have an invention idea, but where do you start? As a patent attorney who works primarily with inventors, entrepreneurs, and startups, you would think the first thing I would tell you to do is go out and file a patent application. But the reality is that smart startups actually delay filing their patent application as long as possible. So in this video, I'm gonna explain the exact right time to file a patent application and why filing too early is just as disastrous as filing too late. So let's step back and talk about how the patent system works so you have some context about filing too early versus filing too late. So the first thing to understand is the United States is a first to file system, which means you get priority based on who files their patent application first. It used to be that it was the first person to invent who got priority, but back in 2013, we came to parity with the rest of the world where priority is based on who files first. And you would think that this means when you come up with an invention, you need to rush out and you need to file a patent application as soon as possible because you want to get the earliest priority date, but it's actually better to file later and to delay costs. So let me give you an example of how the patent process works so you understand why you want to delay these really high costs. So there's two ways to start the patent process. One is with what is called a non-provisional patent application. This is the really expensive formal application. It's probably going to cost you ten, maybe $20,000 just to draft and file that application. And that's not something that startups want to spend their money on right off. They should be saving their money. So it's better for startups to start with what is called a provisional patent application, which is the, the second way to start the patent process. So a, prov a provisional application, it's just a placeholder. It only lasts for one year. It automatically expires the end of the year. And then you have to file that expensive non-provisional patent application. So the provisional is great because it can be done a lot more, lot less expensively. It's uh, more cost effective, which is really good. And it gives you time to develop the invention and determine whether you actually want to spend the money on that expensive non-provisional application. So even once you file that non-provisional application, that application waits in line for one to three years before examination begins, which starts a negotiation with the examiner. And this negotiation involves a back and forth where you get rejections in the form of office actions, and then you have to reply in responses. And when you're working with an attorney on this, it's gonna cost you a lot of money to do this back and forth. So that's gonna be even more cost down the road that you wanna delay as long as possible. So in addition to waiting to file to delay the cost of the expensive non-provisional application and the examination process, it's also better to delay filing so that you can develop the idea more. So there's not really much value in broad general ideas, and that's not where patentability is going to be. And you can certainly file a patent application on a broad general idea, especially a provisional application. The USPTO is gonna slap patent pending on pretty much whatever you file as a provisional application, but it's going to be worthless because patentability is in the details of how something is actually implemented. It's not in the broad idea. And I see this a lot of times where people file their own provisional applications and it's a one paragraph abstract, and it's effectively worthless. Yes, they got a filing date. Yes, they can technically say they're patent pending, but it's actually worthless. So when is the best time to file a patent application? Now, there are four triggers that I tell people that they should consider filing their first patent application. The first three are when you're about to make public disclosures, public uses, or offers for sale. And the reason for that is because if you start making public disclosures, public uses, or offers for sale before you file a patent application, patent rights start to be lost. So you definitely want to file your patent application before doing those things. Another optional trigger is before you start approaching investors or people who are going to license or buy the idea. The reason there is that it's going to improve your pitch and it makes it easier to talk openly about the invention. So when you're going to be talking to, say, investors, you're not going to be making public disclosures, public uses or offers for sale, and you're not going to be starting to forfeit patent rights, but it's better to go into that meeting, be able to say your patent pending, have a priority date, and be able to talk about the invention openly instead of being cagey and not talking about it. And for those of you who have been through raising capital or, or pitching uh, folks on buying or licensing an idea, you should know that a lot of times they're not going to want to sign an NDA. They're going to find it insulting and have that's going to peg you as being a newbie. So the better thing to do a lot of times is just file a provisional patent application, go in, say your patent pending, and that's going to make your pitch a lot better. So then how do you develop your idea so it becomes attractive to investors, 
people who are gonna license the idea or maybe buy the idea. So you have to do, do the work to find the proof that it's actually going to be a good product or business, not just a clever idea. It's never obvious that, hey, I have this cool idea and it's totally gonna work out. I've done this on paper and you know it's gonna be great. You just have to do all the work and you have to put in the time and this idea is gonna become a great product. That's not where value is, is gonna be. So my suggestion is do as much work as you can to flesh out the details of how the idea will actually be a product or business. So if it's a product, try to do some sort of prototype, even if it's a really, really simple one, even if it's janky that you've done yourself, something to demonstrate the way the product is going to look and how it's going to how it's going to work. Also, you need to do a lot of research on the market, understand who the competitors are, what similar products are. And there's always going to be somebody who's going to be, be a competitor. Don't say, that, hey, no, there's nobody out there like this. Nothing out there like this exists. There's always going to be somebody who is going to be somewhat close. That's always going to be part of it. So find those people, do the market research. One of the first things to do is to quickly become an expert in the field in case you aren't already one. So you have to understand the technology as much as possible and also understand the market. You also need to do the research to determine how to make a prototype and determine whether you can do one yourself or whether you need to hire people to uh, help you make a prototype, whether you need to do R&D and whether you need to maybe get investment to actually build your prototype. You need to figure those things out because those are critical to being able to take the next step and either approach investors, creating the product on your own, or maybe trying to license it or have another person buy it. There's a lot of ways to do this initial research, but one of the quickest ways comes from the sponsor of today's video, Patsnap Eureka. So Patsnap Eureka is a great way for coming up with ideas, identifying technical solutions, and fleshing out an idea. So I want to give you the, uh, one specific example of their technical Q&A feature, which is really good for coming up with ideas and also fleshing them out. So I use the example of how to reduce motorcycle noise, and then the AI agents take over and create a search strategy based on this problem they find relevant patents and technical literature. And you can see there's a great listing of relevant patents and literature that it finds. And then uh, Eureka is going to analyze sources and it's gonna identify technical ways to address this problem. So it does some research and it's going to sort of figure out, hey, what are the potential ways to solve this problem? And then it's gonna present ideas for specific technical solutions to addressing the problem. So then it gets into, hey, you know, what are some actual ways that I can modify a motorcycle or parts of a motorcycle to reduce motorcycle noise? And then it's gonna allow you to get more detail about the solutions and the ideas and ask quest technical questions about them. So you can really dig down into specific solutions, solutions that may seem interesting to you, and then you can go from there and you can expand on that and turn that idea and that problem solving into an actual product. So if you want to experience AI that is specific for inventing R&D and patents, try Eureka free at eureka.patsnap.com. Got a special link down below. It's totally worth checking out. So you've been doing this R&D and you're ready to start making public disclosures, public uses or offers for sale or starting to approach potential partners. So what does this really look like? So one is, for instance, if you've been doing R&D, you've developed the product, you're actually ready to start selling the product, then you would wanna file your patent application first. Or if you need to do public market testing, if you can't do private market testing, you have to give it to the public in a way that is gonna be a public disclosure, a public use, or potentially an offer for sale, then you would wanna file a patent application first. Or like I said, before you approach a, pen, a potential licensees, buyers, or before approaching investors, that's not gonna forfeit your patent rights, but that's really gonna help your pitch when approaching them. And it allows you to then be more open with them about what the product is and how it works. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is you're gonna to wanna to file a provisional patent application to establish a, a priority date so you don't lose patent rights or to improve your pitch to those investors or, or licensees or people who are going to be buying the, the invention. Now, how do you prepare a provisional patent application? The first thing to do is make sure that you have as much detail as possible on how the invention is made and used. Protection in a provisional application is directly proportional to the amount of content that you have. And the mistake I see a lot of times is people just file these worthless provisional applications that are maybe a paragraph or just a page and a high level description. That's absolutely worthless. You need to have as much detail as possible about 
how the invention works, how it's made, how it's used, and especially for computer-related technology, what's going on on the back end. It's all about the how and not the what. So it's not about just, it has these functionalities, it's about how are those functionalities achieved. In addition to just your product that you're focusing on, you know, your first initial product, you wanna think about things that are better, things are gonna be your future generations of products. So usually what happens when people are doing R&D, they're only gonna be able to have certain functionalities in their initial product. And they're thinking about down the road, hey, if I had more money, or if I could spend more money on manufacturing, things like that, I may add these features. Now, when it comes to patents, you can protect those things now as long as you can describe them in sufficient detail. So think about if money was no object or if uh, computer technology was cheaper as it's going to become, all these things, if there were fewer limitations, how would you design the product? And specifically, how would competitors design a product that's maybe going to be similar to yours and that you know, is going to be better in some ways? Similarly, you want to think about things that are not as good. So if a competitor comes out and they're doing a crappy downgraded version, you still want to have that sort of variation covered as well. So think about variations that are maybe cheaper, not as good, include those as examples as well, because that gives you broader protection. Now, you should work with a patent attorney when filing a provisional application because, again, what I see a lot is people file their own provisional applications and say, hey, I'm patent pending, but it's totally worthless. It has insufficient detail or it has a lot of the wrong details. Work with a patent attorney and make sure that you have the right details and don't have limiting language. That's another thing that can really harm you is there are a lot of things that you can say in a patent application which inadvertently years down the road will harm your protection and make your protection a lot more narrow than it has to be. And so so just doing a basic provisional application with an attorney can be a great way to protect yourself. So what I like to do is I like to do a, a what I call a coached provisional application. So I will coach people on drafting an invention disclosure that describes the invention in great detail. And then what I'll do is I will format that, scrub that to remove limiting language, and then file that as a provisional application. That tends to be a good balance between cost and, and benefit. You're not spending the, the T you know, the huge expense of having it be fully attorney drafted, which usually isn't necessary for the provisional application stage. And it gives you enough protection by working with the attorney to make sure that it has the right look and feel that's going to give you good optics for going to pitches and showing it to other people, but that's also going to give you sufficient protection. Now, some tips and tricks for drafting an invention disclosure for filing as a provisional is the more technical detail, the better. Don't feel like you're going to be limited by having specific examples. That can actually be really helpful and can give you more protection. It's not going to be limiting, especially when your patent attorney will then scrub out things that are potentially limiting about that. Also, you should focus on the how of the invention works. The how is critical, not just the what. And it's a mistake I see people make a lot is they just talk about the high level functionalities and my software program can do this or that and that's really worthless what is important is how those things are done what is going on on the back end you have to have those details of how things are not how, how things are done and not just well it works better and it's faster well how does it work better how does it work faster you have to include those details because that's where patentability is it's not in things that are just sort of the high level functionalities or the high level benefits also pictures are worth a thousand words that adage is totally true when it comes to patent applications so include diagrams, include pictures, include images. Those are extremely helpful. Um, and what I always tell people is they don't need to be pretty, especially for a provisional application, which is not going to be published. I would prefer that people give me crappy hand-drawn diagrams and images and sketches and things like that than having one perfect CAD drawing of the invention. It's better to have more content that doesn't look as good than to have one picture or something that's perfect but you know, doesn't give as much uh, detail in terms of variations and things like that. So definitely include images uh, where possible. Also provide examples of how the product is made and used if that's important. If the manufacturing process is important, talk about how things are constructed and also walk through an example use case of how a user uses it. So especially for computer things, talk about what the computer is doing, what they're doing with, with the interface and then what's going on on the back end. Again, that comes back to the how. How is How are these things working? Working, right? It's not just what's going on at the user interface and then what pops out. It's what's going on in the back end with what data is transmitted and how is that processed and how is that then converted into an output that is that is output in, in the user interface. 
those are the important things to patentability with, uh, with with computer things. But even for physical products, walk through how a user is going to use it. It does not hurt you to have these specific examples. If anything, that's going to benefit you and broaden protection. Another thing is do not waste your time trying to write like a patent attorney or trying to emulate the writing style of a patent. That is a waste of time and energy. So I see people do this a lot where they're, you know, they're excited. They want to write a patent and they want to do this and learn how to, how to write like a patent attorney. And they spend all their effort on crafting these sentences that sound like a patent and things like that but they should really be spending their time on fleshing out the disclosure more, having more examples, having more technical detail, because that's where protection is. It's in having more detail, not in having things in flowery patent language. And that's why it's important to work with a patent attorney is to draft an invention disclosure like you would be talking to say a product developer, or somebody who is the average person in the field, somebody who would understand the technical side of things, don't write for the audience of being a patent attorney. That's a big mistake that I see people make a lot is that they focus more on form than substance when substance is really where the protection is. Now, if drafting a technical invention disclosure seems to be intimidating, I want to introduce you to Pat Snap Eureka's invention disclosure functionality. And it's a great way to create an initial document. And what it does is it takes a initial technical description, a really simple one of the product, and then it'll flesh that out into an invention disclosure that you can then add to and then you can ultimately give to your patent attorney. So here's an example where I started with a really basic description of an invention that is a modular car our seat uh, for children that's expandable to accommodate multiple children. And so what it's going to do, it's going to read the input and understand, okay, what is this invention? And then it's going to extract how the invention works from the description. So it's going to figure out the functionality. And from that, it'll find information that is relevant to the invention. So it's going to do a search of relevant documents and rele relevant patent uh, applications, issued patents, things like that. And from there, once it gets the background and does the research, it's going to write a detailed invention disclosure based on the research that was done. And all you had to do we we'll start with this really basic uh, invention disclosure. Now, once the whole thing is generated, then you can just export to Word and continue to flesh it out with figures and drawings, adding additional examples and variations like I talked about. And you can then provide this to your patent attorney as an invention disclosure, which, like I said, a great way to file an inexpensive provisional application is to provide the invention disclosure and have your attorney format, scrub, and then file this as a provisional patent application. So as you can see, the process of coming up with ideas, doing R&D with them, and then figuring out when to file a patent an application and then getting your provisional application filed, it, it shouldn't be all that intimidating. It's actually pretty easy, especially when you have the right tools in your corner. So get out there and start working on your important idea today and getting it set up so it's ready to share with the world.